threatened to save my life, and that gave me a vision of a justice system that I want to try to give to other people that can save their lives too. But of course, for so many people, the justice system just, um, you know, it just it grinds people to dust. Hello and welcome to another edition of Prostasia Foundation's podcast broadcast series, Sex, Human Rights and CSA Prevention. Today I'm very excited to have with us Guy Hamilton-Smith. Welcome, Guy. Thank you for having me. So, uh, not everyone who's watching may know your story, and I know that you've got a lot more uh, to your message than just your personal story. Sure. And I do feel that it's very interesting in its own right. So, why don't you give us a, a little bit of a rundown of some of the some of the things that you've uh, experienced? Sure. Uh, well, I mean, this was certainly not the area of law or advocacy that I ever envisioned finding myself in. Uh, but I'm someone who uh, not only have I been a survivor of sexual violence, but I've also, um, you know, I've also committed a crime, um, which led me into law school, and that then uh, in turn led to my becoming involved with this area of work. Um, my uh, offense grew out of what I would say is an addiction that I developed with online pornography when I was um, in my, you know, when I was a teenager. So. Uh, Long, long time ago, uh, but uh, when I was probably about 16 or so, I discovered um, child pornography. I came across it um, online, and I eventually came back to it. I began to download that, um, that those images as well, uh, in addition to essentially anything and everything that I came across, I would download. And I was really ashamed and afraid of you know, what would happen if anyone found out. Uh, and eventually, um, you know, help, and I, but I wanted out, uh, I, but I didn't really know how to ask for help. And help came in the form of an arrest when my girlfriend at the time found, um, found all this pornography on my computer, and she eventually went to the police. And uh, the police arrested me, and I you know, cooperated with them. Uh, and that sort of ended my first career, which was, uh, I was originally in, I was in graduate school for clinical psychology. Uh, law school was never really on the radar, but my experiences with the justice system um, saved my life in a lot of ways. Uh, it got me into recovery, it um, allowed me to get honest with myself and with my family, and it also gave me an interest in law. Uh, but, uh, of course, it also meant that, um, you know, I, I the, was convicted of a felony, and um, it was a very open question as to whether I was going to go to prison or not. And I didn't go to prison. Um, you know, as I said, I went to law school, which I suppose, uh, you know, you can think of it as like a prison of a different, different kind. Um, but I also had to, you know, register as a sex offender, um, which in the state where I was convicted was a 25-year requirement. And I went through law school with. Um, you know, I did very well in law school, and I worked for a, um, a criminal defense law firm where we did state and state and federal criminal defense. Uh, we did trials, we did appeals. Um, I was their death penalty mitigation specialist, so we did death penalty. I did death penalty mitigation work. I did a lot of different things, um, but I still didn't. I didn't do anything related to this work in particular. Um, in fact. I, while I was, I talked about my story with my, I mean, I was open with my friends and my family and my employer. I wasn't really public about my experiences uh, until I, um, well, I decided to sue the government about a law that they had, uh, which said that anyone who's on a sex offense or public conviction registry cannot use social media. And um, I believe that this was unconstitutional. Um, on the on First Amendment grounds, and it turns out that it was unconstitutional. And I used that to um, then get onto social media, and I did a, um, an AMA and Ask Me Anything session. An, an AMA and Ask Me Anything uh, session on Reddit, social, which is a social news site. Uh, and that's a session where you know people can go on to this website and they can say, "Hey, my name is so and like you know I, if you're a celebrity." Um, or if you have an interesting story, you can say, well, my name is so-and-so, ask me anything. So I said, well, my name is Guy Hamilton Smith, I won this lawsuit, um, and, you know, and I'm a sex offender, ask me anything. And uh, it actually went pretty well. <laughs> I mean, uh, it went better than I was anticipating it to go. And, um, and I also got on Twitter, 
uh, and I sent my first tweet. Uh, my wife had to explain to me like, how Twitter sort of worked. I didn't really know because I had been sort of banned from yeah. all social media for like 10 years. So when was the first time you, you got onto social media? Uh, this would have been, I think it was October, I forget the exact date. I think it may have been October 17th, 2017. So it, you seem like so much of a natural to it. It's like you were born. Oh, how many followers right. do you have on Twitter? Uh, I guess now I have like four thousand ish or so. Yeah. I, you know, um, I have been really well. So Twitter's been really interesting for me because, um, so the the Supreme Court decision that kind of like paved the way for me to be able to get onto social media. There is a, a, a passage in that decision that really talks a lot about, in really eloquent language, the benefits that it can have for people, you know, even people who are convicted criminals, to be able to uh, access this world of ideas that they seek to you know, reform and lead meaningful lives. And for me, um, you know, I seem to at least be one individual who is uh, perhaps living proof of that, in that um, it's really kind of changed my life in a lot of different ways and for the better. It's led to me making so many connections with people that I'd only really heard about before and then now I can like talk to them. It led to me um, writing for national outlets about these issues, about sex offense registries, about sexual violence and prevention, uh, which got me invited to speak at conferences and that introduced me to you know, sort of other people, and, and I mean, ultimately, it got me my current job, which is um, I work for the Mitchell Hamlin School of Law and uh, for um, sex, the um, Sex Offense Litigation and Policy Resource Center, uh, which I mean, our sort of entire mission is about effective, uh, effective and sensible sexual violence prevention um, efforts and policy that also um, respects human and constitutional rights. So um, you've said that you got onto the internet and social media. Does that mean that you're allowed everywhere online or are there some limitations? Well, no, there are some limitations because, um, and I actually I just wrote a, uh, published a law review article about this very, uh, this very, I guess you call it a uh, quirk in our, in our sort of system of constitutional law. So the, the Supreme Court, the highest court in the land, said that um, well, you have a constitutional right to be able to access social media. If you finish serving your sentence and you are, um, you know, then then we can't, you know, you, the government can't keep you from doing that. But private actors like um, Facebook, for example, uh, they are certainly free to restrict, continue to restrict who has access to their um, to their site and who doesn't. And so there are a number of private, um, you know, technology platforms that continue to have policies that exclude people who have ever been convicted of sex offense um, from participation. So even though the government can't say, um, well, you can't access the site, um, corporations can can still do that and do. Uh, they they still use the, you know, they they essentially use this policy that um, it's sort of like shorthand. But if you've ever been convicted of sex offense, therefore you're a danger, therefore we're going to exclude you. Um, and there's really no sort of appeals process. For that. So I guess that, that probably makes sense to a lot of people. A lot sure. of people would say, oh, yeah. I don't want to have sex offenders on a social registry site. Yeah. So explain to us why why are they wrong? Well, I mean, they're, not, they're certainly not wrong to not uh, want that. I mean, it's a totally understandable, I mean, it's a, it's a totally understandable motivation, right? Um, we all care very deeply, I think, about creating um, safe communities, both online and in person. Um, but the problem is just that um, it really is based, that sort of policy and that sort of thinking is based um, in a lot of myth and misunderstanding about how sexual harms happen. Uh, and without getting like, too much into the weeds, the reality is that most people who um, who are convicted of a, of a sex offense and then who are held accountable for that, they don't then go on to keep committing sex offenses. Uh, in fact, the vast majority of people uh, who are convicted of sex offense are never then convicted of another sex offense. Um, and that's based on pretty reliable, robust data from many different sources, including the Department of Justice. Um, 
you know, but more, um, you know, sort of more to the point, <clears throat> you know, to the extent that we use these policies as uh, prevention tools, that these policies are in place because we want to have safe online communities. Well, <clears throat> research also demonstrates that for all, um, all reported sex offenses, uh, including those that are technologically facilitated, I believe it's like 95.8% of them are people that these bans would not cover. Like they would not, um, they're people that have no prior record of sexual offending. So, you know, these bans essentially create a false sense of security where we think, oh, well, you know, the people who are going to be engaged in this sort of behavior were banning from the site, when the reality is that's uh, only a drop in the bucket of all the, the sexual harms that are experienced um, online. And so it essentially gives a false sense of security and it misdirects attention and resources from other approaches that could be used to more sensibly and effectively um, prevent and respond to sexual harms um, when they happen. So I don't think this is really very well understood by ordinary people in society. Uh, mm -hmm. I wonder if you feel that part of you being on social media and other people who are on sex offense registries being on social media is, is kind of to humanize them, to get people to you know, see you sure. as a, a person who's got a, you know, a complicated past for this future. Yeah, I mean, I, you know, my story is my story is what it is, and, and I'm certainly not proud of um, the mistakes that I've made, the harm that I've caused, uh, and I will always take responsibility for that. Um, you know, but the the fact is, the the truth of my story and the truth of so many other people's stories is that, um, you know, this was in a sense, this is something I did when I was uh, 22. This is 2006, and it's 2019 now. Um, I've done a lot of things since then, uh, and I've, I've really, um, you know, I, I'm a very different person today than I was then. But the issue, especially when it comes, I mean, when it comes to the criminal legal system at large, but then also, especially with respect to sex offenses, uh, people's identity is sort of fixed in this one place in time. Like, you know, no matter what you then go on to do, you're still a sex offender. Um, and that's sort of the most salient fact about you. Um, and the, of course, we just know that that's not, like, people change. Yeah. I mean, that's just sort of human nature. So is sex offender the right term to use? Or, or is there a, a less stigmatizing term that can maybe let us view these people in a slightly better light. Well, I mean, I, I think that, I mean, there is, of course, a less stigmatizing term, but I mean, I, I would suggest that not only is sex offender unnecessarily stigmatizing, um, it's just not accurate. Like, if uh, my good friend, um, David Garlock, who he, uh, he has a, I don't want to necessarily tell his story for him, but just as a way of massage, this is a powerful story. He, went to prison for um, abuse, for murdering the man who abused him and his brother when they were children. And uh, he served quite some time in prison. Now he's out and he actually works with reintegrating people convicted of sex offenses and on the registry. Um, and so, and I bring up his story because this is an example that he uses whenever he talks about this very issue and I'm just shamelessly stealing it from him. Um, but, you know, have you ever stolen anything in your life? Even as a little kid, probably a candy bar or something. Candy bar or something. It doesn't have to be big. Yeah, anything at all. Um, well, then it would be like saying, "Well, you're a thief." You know, even now, yeah. you know, years and years and years on, it's um, if you call someone a sex offender. I mean, unless someone is out out there committing offenses and harming people like now, presently, then they're not a sex offender. They're someone who's been convicted of a sex offense. That that is true. Um, but there's a there's an implication in the tense, in the present tense of sex offender, that that person is dangerous, that person is committing harm now, that's just not reflected in you know, data, human nature, how we understand people operate, um, and it leaves us less able to effectively, again, you know, respond to and prevent um, sexual harms. So I'm wondering if you, if you believe that this very pervasive stigma um, against sexual offending um, makes it difficult for us to address the shortcomings in the criminal justice system through political processes. Because it seems to me any time a law that on the face of it seems to be tough against mm -hmm. sexual offenders goes uh, 
uh, is presented to Congress, it, it'll just pass with no problem. And then whenever there's something going in the opposite direction to try and take a more nuanced approach that might be more effective, that seems to be you know, soft on, mm -hmm. on offenders, then uh, it doesn't go anywhere. Um, is there a hope? Is there some way that we can actually achieve progress through the political process? Uh, you know, I mean, I think that, um, you know, there is, there are different ways of thinking about political, um, sort of political struggles. I mean, you know, we have the legislature, you know, we have the legislative branch, we have the judiciary, and we have the executive branch. Um, but we also have just, you know, public education. Mm -hmm. And I think that, you know, the more that we get, and it's one of the reasons why I decided to be very public about my story and do this work very publicly, is to um, educate the public, and I think the more people understand um, sort of the reality of what these laws are, how they operate, why they're ineffective, how we can better allocate uh, public safety resources to have better outcomes, uh, then I think that creates more space where eventually lawmakers can can start taking more nuanced approaches. Because I think that you're right, that right now it is very difficult for a lawmaker, even because um, in the work that I do with legislatures, uh, I cannot tell you the number of times I've heard from lawmakers behind closed doors that they understand that these laws are not, they're inhumane, they're not effective, they don't help anyone. But then when it comes time to, you know, well, will you publicly you know, endorse this bill or will you publicly take a stand against that bill, it's a very different story because it's still very difficult for lawmakers to, to do that, to take those steps. Let me go back to something that you mentioned earlier, which was that uh, when you were turned in, it was by your, your girlfriend at yeah. the time. Um, so what about other people who are in that position, if, if you find that your partner uh, maybe is looking at illegal images, mm -hmm. um, what should be your response? Should you go straight to the police? Is, is that always the, the, the right thing to do? You know, I think that's a really, uh, and I should, I also meant to say that, um, like in my case, I'm really grateful that my girlfriend went to the police. Like we're actually, st I'm still, we're still friends. Like we're still friends. We're not, um, that's, I didn't wind up marrying her, but we're, we are still friends. We actually still talk. Um, I think it's a really difficult question. And I think it really turns on the, whatever the facts are in, 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 the, in the situation. Because we have, and I say it's a difficult question, because we have a system that really totally only operates on a very sort of punitive wavelength. And that may not be like the, um, it may not be the appropriate response. I mean, there are a lot of, I mean, will you, I've had a lot of um, friends over the years who have been the victim, who have been victimized, who have been the victims of sexual violence, and you know they decide, well, we don't want to go to the police. You know, we don't want to do that because the system, um, going through the criminal legal process, especially if, when it comes to sexual harms, is oftentimes for survivors being more traumatizing than the actual, um, you know, offense itself. Which I mean, it shouldn't be that way, but 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 it is that way, um, and that's not to say that you should. That's obviously not to say you should never go to the police because I think that there are certainly some times when um, you're seeing that somebody is causing tremendous amounts of harm um, to people that I mean that you really have no you have to do that to get them to stop. Um, so I think it's a it's a tremendously difficult question, uh, and it really shouldn't be. It shouldn't be a difficult question. It should be an easy question. Um, but I think the fact that it's so difficult speaks to how um, I, I think how ill-equipped many of our official responses are when it comes to dealing with sexual harms and sexual violence. And I, I think we'll probably hear um, we we'll probably hear that same answer from a lot of other, you know, um, as I mentioned, like I, I'm also a survivor of sexual violence. I was, I was raped when I was eight years old. Um, and I think that you'll probably also hear that same answer from a lot of other survivors of sexual violence. Um, you know, I know that in a lot of the work that I do, and speaking with uh, other, you know, um, other survivors of sexual violence who have gone through the criminal legal system and also others who haven't, um, that's the sentiment that I hear. Um, well, certainly Prostasia Foundation's approach is, is devoted towards prevention uh, mm -hmm. rather than just you know incarceration of offenders. Right. Um, 
And uh, but we we understood from the outset that it was important to have the background of someone who had gone through uh, the legal system and who had offended, who uh, someone in your position. But it was it was also at the same time a controversial thing for us to do to, to bring you onto our advisory council. <laughs> I, 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 I'm so amazed you did that. I mean, we, we took advice from from a few different people and they said no, don't do this. But then the sure. clincher for me was that I went to every other member of our advisory council and they said, yes, you have to have this person on your advisory council. He's a, he's a good person um, and he's going to add value. Um, we were talking in the car, though, that like uh, there's actually an even higher stigma against um, pedophiles or minor attractive persons, which mm -hmm. you don't classify yourself as, despite right. the fact that you were viewing those images, because why? Well, I mean, well, I had, um, you know, I mean, the way I, I, I had... Gig of, you know, just tons and tons and tons of pornography. Like I also had, I guess, what you refer to as uh, I also really enjoyed milk pornography. I also really like I enjoyed just all kinds of um, porn, uh, and some of it, some of it was illegal. And you know, the, but the fact that um, you know, like I didn't necessarily. You know, at the time, I didn't make the connection in my head that any of this was real. Like, the, there was a sense of unreality about it at the time. And I don't mean to, like, say that to minimize, like, you know, I accept responsibility for my for my offense and the harm that I caused. Um, you know, but, I mean, to me, like, the way I understand what pedophilia is, is it's someone who has um, either primary or an exclusive attraction to, uh, to prepubescent children. And that's just not, that's just not me. So in our last video interview, we spoke to Andrew Potifat, who's the chair of the Internet Watch Foundation, and he actually said uh, something very similar, that, that a large number of the people who are, who are you know, watching or uh, downloading these illegal images, sure. uh, it, it isn't actually their primary sexual attraction. It's kind of like they, they go on a spree, and, and this is what comes up, and it's just, well, oh, look, this is even younger than what I've seen before. Like, how do you think we can get those people, the people who don't identify and who wouldn't be clinically di diagnosed as having any sexually mm -hmm. abnormal interests, what do you think we can do apart from what happened to you, which was being turned into the police? Right. Like, you know, how can we prevent people going down that well, path? I mean, so, you know, I mean, I, I, it's interesting you ask that question because actually this last week in particular, I've really been thinking about, like, I've been going back to the time before my arrest. and. I've been thinking, like, what could be, what could have been different? Like, what could have been different for me that would have um, given me the space to be able to go to someone and say, I need, like, I need help. Um, and you know, I think a lot of that has to do with stigma reduction. I mean, that we have to be able to be more comfortable talking about, you know, whatever our issues are around sex and sexuality. And I mean, I definitely had, I had a really unhealthy relationship with pornography. Um, that I needed help with, and I didn't feel that I could tell anyone about it because I was too ashamed. And so I think if we reduce stigma and we let people know that like it's okay to talk about these issues that you're having, um, I mean that would have you know if if there were an easy path for me to have taken to go to go to someone and say I'm really struggling with this and I you know I want to I want to not do that. Um, you know that may have, that may have made a difference for me, um, and but as it was, uh, you know, I was too I was too afraid. Yeah. I was too afraid, and I was too ashamed to be able to um, to tell anyone about what was really going on. And you know that's why I say, you know, for me, um, I mean, being arrested saved it saved my life in a lot of different ways. Yeah. And it's been, and I I should also say that. Um, I've been exceedingly fortunate. Um, my story is also one that is, uh, you know, marked with a tremendous amount of luck and access to resources. And um, you know, I had family and friends who continued to stay by my side. Uh, I had a lot of things go my way. That you know, if any of that would have been different, my story would have been very different. So. Um, that's why I say, like, 
you know, for me, being right to save my life, and that gave me a vision of a justice system that I want to try to give to other people that can save their lives too. But of course, for so many people, the justice system just, um, you know, it just it grinds people into dust, uh, and you know, needlessly. So we could go on talking forever, but uh, sure. if, there's, if there's one uh, reform to the justice system that you'd like to see um, to to make an improvement to the way we deal with sexual offending, what would it be? The way that we deal with, um, well, I mean, I would say <laughs> that there's probably a lot to unpack in this, but abolish all public conviction registries, and so get rid of them, and take all the money, all the it's the big pile of money that we're spending on maintaining these things and reinvest those into strategies that are going to actually effectively reduce um, the incidence of sexual violence in our society um, and I'm actually presenting on a project about what those would be in Washington DC um, next actually next week but the, the long and the short of it is there's a lot there are much more effective ways to use our very limited public safety resources um, than in yeah, uh, maintaining these lifelong public conviction registries that have no public safety benefit. So if, if, we, if I want to change one thing with the criminal legal system in terms of our response to sexual offending, get rid of those and take all those resources and move them to other places that are going to have a, an appreciable impact on reducing uh, child molestation on reducing rape, um, on reducing you know uh, online offenses, um, because right now what we're doing is just it's it's not that it's not really geared towards prevention. We're effectively responding to harm. So if people would like to find out more about the issues you've been talking about, how can they do that? Uh, well, uh, you can you can follow me on Twitter if you want to. <laughs> um, and uh, this, I mean, this paper that I'm working on right now is uh, hopefully, I'm going to hope to have it published somewhere uh, where yet yeah, remains to be seen. But, um, you know, if uh, you should be able to access it through my website at some point, which is also linked in my um, Twitter bio. Excellent. Well, if, uh, if people would like to check it out, we'll have links to the Twitter bio and the website. Um, in the podcast information screen, or if you're watching on YouTube, you'll be able to find it there. So thanks, everyone, for joining us for another edition of Sex, Human Rights, and CSA Prevention. Guy, thank you very much for joining us. Thank you for having me. We'll see you next time. Bye-bye for now.